The case of Emmett Till was the spark that lit the fire that became the civil rights movement. Who was Emmett Till? Where did he come from? And what transpired? Emmett Till was born July 25th, 1941 in Chicago, Illinois. His mother, Mamie Carthen, later Till, was born in Webb, which is Tallahatchie County, Mississippi. It's a picture of Mamie, and as a two-year-old, moved to Argo, Illinois, which was about 12 miles from Chicago. In October of 1940, she married Louis Till, and Emmett was born nine months later. The relationship between Emmett's parents was tumultuous, to say the least, and they separated in 1942. Lewis joined the Army, was court-martialed for having been convicted of raping two women and killing a third while stationed in Italy. He was the all-American boy. <laughs> he was executed by the Army for willful misconduct. His few belongings were shipped to Mamie, and they included a silver ring engraved with the initials L.T., which plays a major, major role in this saga, as does Mamie. Reverend Moses Wright, who's either an uncle or a great uncle of Mamie, went to Chicago in August of 1955 to officiate at a funeral, and after telling stories about country life in Mississippi, and he was from Mississippi, brought back with him two grandsons, Curtis Jones and Wheeler Parker, Jr., and his nephew, Emmett. Before leaving Chicago or Argo for the trip to the Wright's home in a place called Money, Mississippi, we'll see, him, see it on a map, and it's not much of a place. Uh, Mamie warned Emmett to avoid conversations with white people, speak only when spoken to, always say, yes, sir, and yes, ma'am, and if a white woman walks toward you, take to the street and lower your eyes. Before leaving, Mamie gave Emmett the silver ring with the engraved initials LT. Emmett arrived in Mississippi on August 21, 1955, and just put that date in the back of your mind. On August 24th, Three days later, here's a map of Mississippi. The area we're going to talk about is something called the Mississippi Delta, which is extremely fertile farmland. These are the counties in the Mississippi Delta. In the morning of August 24th, Emmett Wright's three grandsons picked cotton all morning, and as a reward did not attend Wright's Wednesday night prayer meeting. Now, throughout the South, the Wednesday night prayer meeting is sacrosanct. In civic organizations, even in Memphis, maybe to this day, you don't dare schedule anything on Wednesday night. I mean, that's church night. But at any rate, uh, their reward was not having to go to church. <laughs> and with the loan of Wright's 1941 Ford, and despite Wright's admonition to drive only a short distance from home, they in fact drove some three miles to Bryant's Grocery and Meat Market in Money, Mississippi. And this is a picture of it as it existed at that day and time. There are conflicting stories about what happened in the store, that Carolyn Bryant was alone minding the store, and that Emmett was in the store there for, and they were alone for no more than one minute. Here you can see, this was the right home. This is the store at Money, Mississippi. It's not even a crossroads, it's at the end of a T. I mean, I've never been there. I've been to a lot of places in the Delta. That's one place I've not been. Now. Who was Carolyn Bryant? Carolyn Holloway Bryant was born July 23rd, 1934 in Kruger, Mississippi, which is a plantation town, which means that there's the home generally of the owner. There's sheds where all the equipment's kept. There's a cotton gin, maybe a tenant house or two and not much else. Her father was a plantation manager, suffered a series of strokes, and died when she was 15. 
She and her mother moved to Indianola, which incidentally is a city where the Citizens Council was later founded. Carolyn won several beauty contests and met Roy, Roy Bryant at a party. Roy joined the Army, saved his money, and he and Carolyn eloped and married when she was 16 and prior to her finishing high school. Roy Bryant was the son of Eula Lee Morgan Milam Bryant. Eula Lee had eight sons and three daughters by two different men, was a tough matriarch who drank whiskey for breakfast and carried a pistol in her purse. This was a true racist family. Roy and his half-brother, J.W. Milam, were close. The Bryant-Milam clan were what is known as Peckerwoods by their betters. You've got to take a look at the Mississippi social strata that existed particularly in the Delta in this day and time. Obviously, at the bottom, you had African Americans, and slightly above them, you would have sharecroppers, some black, some white, probably more white than black, and then you had the Peckerwoods. These were people who had pickup trucks, did odd jobs, and really made a lot of money bootlegging. Now, Mississippi was dry, except they had on the books something called a black market tax. And as long as you and the sheriff of the county could agree, you were allowed to sell liquor by the sheriff who had jurisdiction over everything. And the kickbacks to the sheriff were such that you only had to serve one or two terms and you could retire for life. In fact, in fact, Mississippi did not adopt a local option county by county until 1966. And guess when they totally repealed all liquor laws? January 1st, 2021. <laughs> That's the way it was. Okay, above the Pecker Woods, you had your small farmers, small farm in this part of Mississippi being something under maybe 1,500 acres, because this is very, very fertile cotton land. You had your merchants, professionals, bankers, then the plantation owners, like Big Daddy in the movie, Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. So with our cast in mind, let's return to August 24th of 1955, which was a fateful day to say the least. Carolyn Bryant had two versions of what transpired on that date. The first version was to law enforcement. Quote, I waited on him, and when I went to take his money, he grabbed my hand and said, how about a date? And I walked away from him, and he said, what's the matter, baby? Can't you take it? He went out the door and said goodbye, and I went to the car and got my pistol, and when I came back, he whistled at me, this while going after my pistol, and he didn't do any further after seeing the pistol. At the trial, which we'll get to later, Carolyn testified, and I put it in my notes two different places, and I'm going to save that for the trial. Years later, in an interview, one Ruthie Mae Crawford told a documentarian that she watched Emmett through the plate glass window the entire time and that the only mistake he made was placing his candy money directly in Carolyn's hand rather than placing it on the counter, as was the practice between blacks and whites. This was August 24th. Again, this is a very narrow timeline. The following Sunday, on August 28th, at about 2 a.m., Moses Wright was awakened by two white men, J.W. Malam, who you've seen, and Roy Bryant, who called out, we want to talk to you about that boy from Chicago who done that talking up at money. Both were carrying 45 automatics, marched through the house, accosted Emmett, and asked whether he, quote, did the talking, end quote. Emmett said, yeah and they took him away. Elizabeth Wright, Moses' wife, ran to the home of white neighbors for help. 
The wife wanted to be of assistance, but her husband negated that. He wouldn't agree. Elizabeth returned home, packed some suitcases, got Moses to drive her to her brother's house in Sumner, Mississippi, and that's going to be a pivotal place as we move on, told her brother goodbye, and then Moses took her to the train station in Clarksdale, where she boarded a train bound from Chicago and never returned to Mississippi. The IC in Illinois Central ran right through Memphis, Clarksdale, and further south. On Wednesday, three days later, Robert Hodges, a 17-year-old, was running his trot lines. Now, what's a trot line? A trot line is a fishing mechanism that's used throughout the South, mainly to catch catfish and sometimes carp. And in essence, at the water line, you'll have two jugs that are floaters, something like a Clorox jug. There'll be a line from the jug to an anchor at the bottom of the body of water on each side, another line that runs between the two jugs, and from that you dangle hooks, and it's an amazing number of fish that get caught on these hooks. And that's the way a lot of commercial fishing is done throughout the South. Uh, one of my earlier lives, I sold fishing tackle and sold a lot of the material for trot lines. Uh, <laughs> but at any rate, Robert Hodges was running the trot lines when he saw toes protruding from the water. Hodges told his father, who called his landlord, who then called the landlord's brother, who's a deputy, who then called Sheriff H.C. Strider. The sheriff obtained a boat, and with some difficulty, they pulled a body anchored by an iron fan from the Tallahatchie River. The fan had been lashed to the body of the corpse with barbed wire that had become loose, and for that reason, and that reason only, the body could still be at the bottom of that body of water. And this is John Ed Cothran, who was the deputy sheriff from Lafleur County, who met Sheriff Strider. There's a picture of him with the fan, and you can see, if you look closely, some of the barbed wire that was around the body that was lashed to the fan. There was always an issue as to which county had jurisdiction over the apparent murder, and since the body was found on the Tallahatchie County side of the river, all future proceedings were held in Tallahatchie County. Strider noted that what looked like a bullet wound was above the right ear, and the left side of the face of the body was beat up. You're going to see that in a minute. Reverend Wright was called and identified the body, and a silver ring was removed from Till's finger. It was engraved with the initials LT. Pictures of the body were taken by the Greenwood Police Department, and a black undertaker was called to take the body away. Through a long set of circumstances, no funeral was held in Mississippi, and the body was sent to Chicago. And there, in Chicago, Mamie Bradley, not to be deterred, mounted an amazing, amazing publicity campaign which resulted in Chicago newspapers, radio, and television stations concentrating on this story. The heading in Chapter 8 of the Tyson book, which is in your bibliography, sums it up. Mamie made the earth tremble. The body was returned to Chicago September 2nd, and on September 3rd, over 40,000 people viewed the body. The funeral was held on the 6th, and by that, according to the Chicago Tribune, over 100,000 people had viewed the body. Now, Mamie wanted more than a funeral. She wanted to see what happened to her son in Mississippi. So she insisted on an open coffin. And all these people that walked by saw this coffin, and this is what Emmett Till looked like. Not a very pretty picture. Now, let me digress just a bit to put the killing of a black person in Mississippi in perspective in 1955. We've got some lawyers here in the audience, and you're going to have a hard time relating to this. 
but only a few weeks prior to the Till kidnapping and murder, Reverend George Lee and a Lamar Smith had been killed because they attempted to register black voters. On August 12th, August 12th, this is just a little over two weeks prior to the Till abduction, Lamar Smith went to the courthouse in Brookhaven, Mississippi, to obtain absentee ballots he was distributing to African Americans so they could vote without intimidation. 10 o'clock on a Saturday morning, square filled with people, three white men set upon the unarmed Smith as he crossed the courthouse lawn and beat him mercilessly. Then at least two of them held him while another fired a 38 revolver into his heart and by one account filed a second shot into his mouth. Dozens, dozens of people stood nearby. The sheriff was close enough to recognize at least one of the killers and to describe the bloodstains on the shirt of another. Uh, subsequently, an FBI investigation stated flatly that his assailants killed Smith in front of the sheriff. But as you can see from the newspaper account, the killer was never indicted because no one, no one on a Saturday on that courthouse lawn would admit that they saw a white man shoot a black man. FBI investigation was snuffed out by one J. Edgar Hoover. May 7, 1955, one George W. Lee was the first American, African American, to register to vote since Reconstruction in Humphreys County, where black people were a majority of the population. He started making speeches to get black people to register in Humphreys County. In less than a month after one of his speeches, and on May 7th, another car pulled alongside his just before midnight. An unidentified assailant fired three shotgun blasts, shattering his jaw and the windshields of his car. An autopsy extracted lead pellets from his face that were consistent with buckshot, but the sheriff decided it was a traffic accident and to close the case claimed that this buckshot were dental fillings torn loose by the impact of the crash. <laughs> so that's what makes, to me, the Emmett Till case so special. Both of these instances there was not enough evidence for a grand jury to present an indictment. Now, let's spring forward a few weeks to uncover how the Till matter got to trial. I received a blog from Renee Turner, a friend, written by one M.J. O'Brien, who is now a professor at Allegheny College, and was in the process of writing a book about the Jackson sit-ins, later published in 2013 under the title, We Shall Not Be Moved. Uh, according to the blog, and these are quotes from the blog, because she tells the story much better than I could tell it. Sometimes life hands you a gift. You can't predict it, aren't looking for it, can't even imagine it. Such a treasure walked into my life in the person of Jerry Murph Spears nearly 20 years ago. I was about halfway through a 30-year stint as communications director for a not-for-profit when Jerry relocated to the Northern Virginia area and was very Southern. In one of my early conversations, I discovered that she hailed from Mississippi, which piqued my interest. But somehow Jerry was different. When I'd casually talk to her and drop a reference or two about the Magnolia State, she would look at me knowingly and, I feared, wonder how a Yankee knew so much about her native Southland. One day I decided to ask her to lunch and spill the beans. That's where, after telling Jerry about my project and my many trips to Jackson for research about some of the generalities about the city and, and that they're at the downtown Woolworths, and the ensuing Jackson movement, she stopped me and said, quote, we were living in Jackson then. Whoa, what? Yes, we had 
just moved to Jackson a few months before, and my mother wouldn't let me out of the house when those demonstrations were going on. Score. I had just found another unanticipated witness to history. I offered to let her read the manuscript to see what she thought. She accepted, genuinely interested in retracing her Mississippi heritage, but it was the next thing that really floored me. Yeah, we moved down to Jackson from up in Tallahatchie County, where my dad was a car salesman, she said in her slow southern drawl. In fact, do you know, he served on the grand jury for the Emmett Till case. I was so shocked I had to ask her to repeat herself. Your dad served on that grand jury, I asked. Sure did, Jerry replied. Not the ones that let the guys off, she hastened to add. The jury that told the judge that they thought there was enough evidence to bring the case to trial. I was thunderstruck. How could this sweet, discerning, harmless woman have anything to do with the most celebrated and horrifying case of the 1950s, the murder that launched the modern civil rights movement? Is your dad still alive? I asked haltingly. Sure is, Jerry replied. He's coming up in a few weeks if you want to talk to him. You think he would be interested in putting his recollections on the record, I wondered? Don't see why not, she said. We can at least ask and find out. And that's how, nearly 50 years after the Till murder, I came to be in Jerry's living room with Randall Red Murph, quizzing him about what he remembered about this involvement in one of the most important grand jury decisions of the 20th century. Murph related that he and 17 other white men from Tallahatchie County found themselves at the Sumner Courthouse, and this is the courthouse in Sumner, Mississippi, in Tallahatchie County for whatever reason. Some of these names are right out of Faulkner. Yeah. <laughs> Tallahatchie County and neighboring Yalabusha County <laughs> are tiny in population, and they have two county seats. I don't know why. They have two courthouses in each of these two tiny counties. And in Tallahatchie County, there's one in Sumner, and there's one in Charleston. Murph related that he and the 17 other white men from Tallahatchie County, white men, remember white and remember men, found themselves at the Sumner Courthouse on September 6, 1955, to hear the evidence that had been discovered against two of their own white citizens and neighbors, Jerry, J.W. Malam, and his younger half-brother, Roy Bryant. Originally from Calhoun County in the north-central part of the state, Red had migrated to the little town of Webb, Mississippi. He said, and this is a quote, population 650 if you count the bird dog, end quote. I've been there. I, I think there's a blinking light there. I'm not too sure there's a three-way white, because in some of these southern towns, you know, Saturday night for entertainment, you go downtown to watch the traffic light change signals. <laughs> Nothing else to do. <laughs> so Red said population 650 if you count the bird dog. In 1949, he moved there to open a Chevrolet car and truck dealership. This geographical point is also important since Webb sits less than three miles southeast of Sumner, the county seat where the trial was held. In 1955, the population of the entire Tallahatchie County was only about 30,000, two-thirds of whom were recorded as non-white. Of the 10,000 or so whites, no more than 3,000 were adult males. Thus, jury selection was limited to whether or not the men had paid the $2 annual poll tax and were registered to vote. And that usually gets us down to no more than 1,500. <laughs> As a result, Red said, I usually got jury service about every two years. It was not just by chance then that he became a part of the jury pool. It was a necessity of judicial life in Tallahatchie County. Every available voting-aged white male, essentially the only citizens eligible to vote, was needed. And again, no blacks, no women. 
Red knew the two men who were accused of the crime. Both Milam and Bryant were customers of his at the Chevy dealership. Both had bought trucks from Red, in fact. It was in one of those trucks, Milam's 55 Chevy pickup, that Emmett Till was kidnapped and driven all over LaFleur, Tallahatchie, and Sunflower counties before being taken to the edge of the river, stripped, shot, killed, tied up, and thrown in. And this is the part that gave me chills, and I'm going to tell you why, and it gives me chills every time I read it. He commended the work of the jury foreman, a Mr. Arnold Turner. The foreman of the grand jury was a good friend of mine, Red told me, and that was one reason I got on it. Turner was from a prominent Jewish family in Tallahatchie County. His uncles ran the largest dry goods store in Webb, Turner Brothers, and Red believes that Turner may have had a hand in getting him on the grand jury. I talked to someone and I said, well, I hope I get on the grand jury because I don't want to serve on the other one, and that's how it turned out. He also said Turner was a good and strong foreman for the task. Arnold handled it well. And Red said, and he was fair with everyone. Now, this is where I got the real chills. Arnold Turner was a client of mine. <laughs> he became a good friend of mine. On the Jewish holiday of Passover, which is a family type service, I spent many, many Passovers on the Turner Farm, which is halfway between Webb and Sumner. When Arnold and his wife Dorothy would fly out of Memphis on an early morning flight, they would generally spend the night with me so as to not have to drive when it was still dark in the morning to the airport. Never once did he ever mention this to me. And until this blog came out, none of his three children ever knew about it. It just floored me. The grand jury met on the afternoon of the day after Labor Day at the beginning of the three-week court section. The ha Tallahatchie County attorney, one Hamilton Caldwell, uh, and other court and law enforcement officials presented evidence. But Caldwell was less than lukewarm about an indictment, quote, because he doubted that the jury would convict any white man found to have murdered a black who was accused of insults to a white woman. We met in the courthouse, Red said, in the jury room upstairs in the courthouse. Anyone familiar with the film To Kill a Mockingbird would have some idea of what this courthouse looked like, although perhaps not quite as polished as a Hollywood recreation, but it was the grandest structure in the area. At any rate, that's where Red and his band of grand jury brothers met, led by Arnold Turner, to consider the evidence gathered against Milam and Bryant. In Red's mind, there was no doubt what needed to be done. It was enough, he told me. We knew that we could not push it aside. We couldn't legitimately say, well, that just happened to let it go. The indictment came down on either September or 6th, and there's, or 7th, and there's conflicting data on that. And the lawyers were like this. The indictment came down Fed September 5th or 7th, and the trial began September 19th. <laughs> yeah. The judge from Sardis was one Curtis Swango, and from everything I've read, appears to have done just a stellar job in a very, very hostile environment. On Monday, September 19th, jury selection began. Of course, it was an all-white male jury, and here they are, tried and true, no black jurors, no women jurors. Ten were selected on Tuesday the 20th, two more. Now, selection was difficult because when they pulled in all of the possible jurors, a substantial number of them had already contributed to the, quote, defense fund, end quote. <laughs> so they were automatically disqualified. <laughs> all eyes were on the courthouse in Sumner with media from all over the country having descended on this tiny 
town, much reminiscent of the Scopes trial many years previously in Dayton, Tennessee, which was 20 miles north of where I grew up. The courtroom was full and over a thousand people were standing outside. Order was maintained by Sheriff H.C. Strider. We'll see him again. A 300-pound behemoth of a man who, in addition to being sheriff, was the owner of 1,500 acres of cotton land farmed by 35 black sharecroppers. Additionally, he maintained a general store and filling station on his property and operated a crop dusting business. Strider always carried an oversized blackjack in his pocket and at the insistence of Judge Swango was actually required to provide a table for the black press. And here's some of the black press. And as the lawyers in this room know, generally in a trial, or at least in all the trials in which I've been involved, and there have been a lot of them, the sheriff is charged with maintaining order in a courtroom. That's their job. Well, that was Sheriff Strider's job. But guess what? Every morning, courtroom is full. They're getting ready to begin court. And his salutation to the black press is, and I'm quoting, good morning, niggers. <laughs> Can you imagine that? So this gives us some idea of the atmosphere in which the trial proceeded. On Wednesday, the 21st, Moses Wright testified as first witness for the prosecution. District attorney referred to him as Uncle Mose, as was a custom when you refer to an older African American. Wright identified Milam and Bryant as the persons who removed Till from Wright's home. The next witness, Chester Miller, the black undertaker, testified about picking up the body and at the request of the officers at the scene, removing the ring from the body for purposes of identification. Mamie took the stand on the 22nd and testified regarding her son's body and the ring she had given him just prior to leaving Chicago. They're tracing the evidence. The defense attorney on cross-examination painted her as being from Chicago and thus putting Chicago on trial for interfering with Mississippi. In essence, the defense was telling the jury that Southside Chicago was getting what it deserved. Willis Reed, an 18-year-old, was the next witness. Reed had been unearthed by the black underground that had for days been scouring the countryside for witnesses. Reed testified that he had seen Till in the back of a pickup truck with four white men in the cab and three colored men in the back, one of whom he identified as being Emmett Till. Reed went to Leslie Malum's barn for water and identified J.W. as coming outside the barn for water. He further testified that he heard somebody hollering from the barn after J.W. returned and, quote, heard some licks like somebody was whipping somebody. The Black Underground unearthed two other witnesses, the two African Americans who were seen riding with Till in the back of Milam's pickup truck. But at the date of the trial, they couldn't be located, and there was a good reason. Sheriff Strider, that we've seen two pictures of, also got wind of this, had them picked up, he took them to the jail at the courthouse in Charleston and locked them up so they couldn't testify in the trial in Sumner, 15 miles away. <laughs> the first witness for the defense was Carolyn Bryant. When asked about events of August 24th, the prosecutor objected and the objection was sustained. These events had nothing to do with a murder charge. The defense then asked the court to proffer her testimony, that is, just read it into the record, and maybe they could bring it up on a, if there was an appeal, maybe not. And, and this was the testimony that she elicited in open court that I alluded to earlier in the presentation. Quote, 
this nigger man came in the store and he stopped there at the candy counter. I asked him what he wanted. And I got it and put it on top of the candy case. I held out my hand for his money. He caught my hand. He said, how about a date, baby? And I turned around and started to the back of the store. He came down that way and caught me at the cash register. Well, he put his left hand on my waist and he put his other hand on the other side. He said, what's the matter, baby? Can't you take it? Fifty years later, Karen told the author of The Blood of Emmett Till, William Bradford, Bradford Huey, that the above was not true. Nothing that boy did could ever justify what happened to him. She was quoted as saying. The next witness for the defense, Dr. L.B. Otkin, was a practicing doctor in Greenwood and had, quote, viewed the body in the colored funeral home. And bear in mind, then and today in the South, you have white funeral homes and you have colored funeral homes. Colored funerals are much more expensive than white funerals. And I found out that it was a cultural type thing. And in metropolitan areas, you had burial policies or funeral policies that were used by what they called debit collectors who went out on Saturday, if Friday was payday, to collect from all of their customers the dollar or two dollars a week that they would contribute to their funeral later on. And black funerals still are a real spectacle. And the owners of the black funeral homes, at least in Memphis, Tennessee, make a lot of money. A lot. Including uh, one of our former congressmen, Congressman Ford. And there's this huge Ford families and now maybe four Ford funeral homes. And that was the basis of their wealth. Sheriff Strider was the next witness who testified that he saw the body as it was pulled from the river and stated it was not capable of identification. All of the witnesses for the prosecution were black and all of the witnesses for the defendants were white. After blatant segregationist themed closing statements from defense counsel, and I think there were five of them, the jury retired at 234 and after about an hour, the jury returned with a not guilty verdict. Moses Wright, as a witness, was one of the first times that a black accused a white of a crime in a Mississippi court of law. And Moses, right after the trial, had to leave the state and never returned. And the young man that I showed you the picture of earlier after the trial <laughs> left the state never to return. Here's Malam and Brian at leaving the courthouse with their wives and the Memphis paper, September 24th, 1955, showing they are acquitted after the jury stayed out a total of 67 minutes. Now look at this timeline. And Pat McKinley's in the office has tried more jury trials than any human being, than any lawyer that I've ever met. But look at this timeline. August 21st, Till arrives. August 24th, the incident at Bryant's Grocery. He's abducted on the 28th. The body's found on the 31st. Sent to Chicago on the 2nd. Funeral is on the 6th. The same day the grand jury's impaneled. And the next day an indictment comes down. And 12 days later a trial begins. The acquittal is on the 23rd, which is less than a month, or just a little over a month, a month and two days after the arrival of Emmett Till in Mississippi. Now, the lawyers in the room, has anybody seen a trial move any quicker than that? <laughs> Especially with a grand jury involved. Especially with a grand jury involved. Well, the story doesn't end there. Malam and Brian are acquitted. But they get paid to do an interview for Look Magazine 
which was a very well-known periodical of the day. And this is the quote that was printed in Look Magazine, quoting J.W. Malam. Quote, well, what else could we do? He was hopeless. I am no bully. I never hurt a nigger in my life. And I like niggers in their place. I know how to work them, but I just decided it was time a few people got put on notice. As long, long as I live and can do anything about it, niggers are going to stay in their place. Niggers ain't going to vote where I live. If they did, they'd control the government. They ain't going to go to school with my kids. And when a nigger gets close to mentioning sex with a white woman, he's tired of living. I'm likely to kill him. Me and my folks fought for this country, and we got some rights. I stood there in that shed and listened to that nigger throw that poison at me, and I just made up my mind. Chicago boy, I said, I'm tired of them sending your kind down here to stir up trouble. God damn you, I'm going to make an example of you just so everybody can know and how me and my folks stand. And that was the saga that, in my opinion, gave much impetus to the civil rights movement. And very frankly, as you'll hear next week, that was a direct link to December of 1955 when Rosa Parks decided not to give up her seat. That was also the month that a young black minister was grudgingly forced to enter into the fray in Montgomery, Alabama. His name, Martin Luther King. So there's a strong nexus between this murder Rosa Parks in the beginning of Martin Luther King's crusade. Thank you all.